display. Robert and Brian Murray as Kevin have just five days left to prepare their case for the trial in the final episode of The Franchise Affair. Surely they haven't gone out. The line's dead. Anymore. I'll take you back to the hotel. In case they got the little swines that did it. Mother wants to know why Stanley didn't shoot them on the spot. Poor Stan. Five years avoiding Hitler, and now this happens. He's quite a hero. And this, I take it, is an example of provincial humour. I wish to know if you have a Danish gentleman staying in your establishment. A businessman from Copenhagen. Yes, I am well aware that this is the third call I made to Newcastle this morning. You... This little hunch of Robert's is beginning to set my teeth on edge. Miss Tuff? My senior clerk, Mr. Hesseltine. My dear lady. Mr. McDermott. Good day, sir. Good day to you, sir. Good day. Mr. Kevin McDermott, Mrs. Sharp, Miss Marion Sharp, my partner Neville Bennett. Madam, there was a time when only the guilty were put in the pillory. It will give me great pleasure to defend you and your daughter, especially against a prosecuting counsel as irritating as Miles Allison. Well, we are a good cause. I have never taken the slightest interest in any cause that was not to my own immediate advantage. But I think we shall get along very well. Oh, not at all, madam. I'm quite insufferable. I have only one ambition, and that is to alter everything that is alterable in the law and to make as much noise as possible in the doing of it. I've heard it said, Mr. McDermott, that your presence in a case adds 50% to its newspaper value. Well, I hope that isn't true. We've had quite enough publicity. My presence in a case, my dear Miss Sharp, merely adds a good deal more than 50% to its cost. Kevin. Thank you. I have you, Mr. Roberts. The Danish gentleman. He's on the office instant now. We can speak with you. Excuse me, Kevin. This could be important. Well done, Timmy. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, unless we mean to allow the prosecution to strip Mr. us of every rag we possess in open court next week, may I suggest we make an immediate start? Here beginneth the first lesson. You'll have plenty of time to flatter me later, Mr. Bennett. In the meantime, we have precisely six days including the Sabbath, to learn the truth about Miss Elizabeth Kay. So, Mr. Blair, I say to myself, but how sure are you, Ina, with this photograph? I am, uh, uh, uh for years, uh, curious. curious, yes, I am very curious. Have excuse, please. Uh, <laughs> The English, I like to make notes. Cure <laughs> us. Very good. Um, the photograph, Mr. Langer. Yes, the, the photograph. I know they are wrong, and so I seek explanation from myself. A twilling, a twins, perhaps. Doppelganger. 
Until Feldieth, I think of them all, but no, I know it's none of these, and yet I know they're wrong. I know that this is not Betty Kane. Now, I think I should tell you that my old father owns a hotel in Copenhagen, the Hotel of the Red Shoes in the Helgelandskade. And this, this is little Mrs. Chadwick who stays at my father's hotel with her husband, Bernard, who buys very fine china. Ye gods, do you believe in miracles, Mr. Lander? Boys, boys, the miracle, I regret to say, has not yet occurred. The miracle will be Mr. Bernard Chadwick, who buys very fine china, and we have very little time left to find him. Is that the Danish embassy? Uh, please, yes, I'd like to talk to something about caravans lights there are in Wales. Have you been here all night? Hmm. I'll make you a fresh cup of tea. Miss Tuff, what are you doing here on a Sunday? I come in every Sunday to water the plants. Good Lord. Is there anything I can do to help? Not unless you can find Mr. Chadwick. We have the man's name, his address, his place of work. All that took three days, another 24 hours to obtain a subpoena, which we can't now serve. Because Bernard William Chadwick has chosen this week of all weeks to take his wife on a caravan holiday in Wales. Oh, dear. Mr. Bennett's gone after him, but unless we can trace him before tomorrow, we're in real trouble. Can you do it then? Uh, just ring the bell when you finish, I'll come and lock up. Thanks, Jack. We'll just wait a couple of minutes. Can it really be any more daunting when it's full of people? Where shall we be, Mother and I? Uh, here. Uh, the witnesses wait through that door there. In a way, it's worse for them. Every eye turned on them as they come in. Once the court's sitting, they'll be the centre of attention, not you. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I love you. I know you do. Silence in court. have anything further to do before my lords the king's justices for oyer and termina and general jail delivery for the city of Norton. Draw near and give your attendance. God save the king. <laughs> so, Mr. Piper, you were some way from the bus stop when you say you saw this young girl who may or may not have been Elizabeth Kane. I hope it's her, all right. Ah, yes. You know it was her because you recognized her picture in the paper. Did you also recognize the car from a newspaper picture? 
I've not seen any pictures of the car. It must have been a fine, clear evening. Was it a fine evening, Mr. Piper? No. I beg your pardon, Mr. Piper. I don't think the jury can quite hear you. It was raining. Yes, indeed it was. Raining quite heavily, I believe. The 28th of March. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Piper, but at 7 p.m. at that time of the year, wouldn't it already be quite dark? It was getting dark, yes. You were walking your dog towards the gas works. This young girl was waiting for the Birmingham coach. In that case, the car that you say that you saw, which may or may not belong to my clients, would have been moving in the same direction as you. So? Moving away from you, Mr. Piper, in the darkness and the heavy rain, are you long or short sighted? I saw it. And I saw her. I did see it, Your Honor. I have no further questions for this witness, my lord. Do you wish to re-examine, Mr. Allison? No, my lord. You may stand down, Mr. Piper. I did see it. Call Rose Glynn. Rose Glynn. You heard this screaming which you believe to have come from the attic of the franchise long before there was any suggestion of a charge being made against Miss Sharp and her mother. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. You're welcome. One moment, Miss Glynn. Mr. McDermott. Now, Miss Glynn, I'm sure I don't have to remind you that you're still on oath is a rather heavy punishment for someone who takes an oath to speak the truth and then tells lies. I know that. Mm, yes, I'm sure you do. Tell me, my dear, are you still in possession of the watch you stole from Miss Sharp? I object, my lord. I never stole a bloody watch. The silly bitch lost it. I never stole nothing from them bitches. Silence in court. That girl's evidence was a pack of lies. They have no proof that she was lying, aren't they? She lied about stealing that watch. She lied about screaming. But if Kevin McDermott can't shift her, nobody can. Never mind, dear. Perhaps never will find all Mr. Chadwick. It's too late, I'm afraid. When I spoke to Neville last night, he was on his way to Cheshire. We we'll just have to hope that Kevin McDermott does rather better with Betty Kay this afternoon. You've told us it was dark when you arrived at the franchise that night. Was it really so dark? Yes, it was. Too dark to see the outside of the house? Yes. But then the night you escaped, perhaps that wasn't so very dark. That was even darker. So that you could not possibly have seen the outside of the house on either occasion? Never. Then let us consider what you say you could see from the round window of your prison in the attic. In your statement to the police, you have said the driveway went straight from the gates and a divided round a fountain. Yes. How did you know that? I could see it. From where? From the window in the attic. Ah. But from the round window in the attic, Miss Kane, it was impossible to see the driveway at all, or the fountain, or the gates. The edge of the roof cuts off the view. Are we to understand, Miss Kane, that you see on a different principle to ordinary beings? Can you, for example, see around corners, or is it all done with mirrors? It's like I described. Certainly it's as you described, but what you described is a view of the driveway as seen, let us say, by somebody looking over the wall at it, not by somebody looking at it from the round window in the attic. Do you have a witness as to the extent of the view from the window? Uh, Detective Inspector Grant, my lord. And two others. One with normal vision will be sufficient. Uh, uh, my name is Neville Bennett. Mr. Addison. Miss Kane, you arrived at the franchise by car. Yes. If it was dark, as you say it was, then surely the car must have been driving with lights. Yes, that's how I saw it. That's how I saw the drive and the fountain and the car lights. Thank you. My lord, before this witness leaves the box, I have just received some important instructions 
and I ask leave to put some further questions in cross-examination. Do you have any objections, Mr. Addison? Uh, no, my lord. You may proceed. Have you ever been abroad, Miss Kane? No. You have not, for instance, been to Denmark recently? No. Do you know a man called Bernard Chadwick? No. He's not a friend of yours? I've just said I didn't know him. You surpass yourself, Mr. McDermott. My lord, certain evidence of a rather startling nature has just come into my possession. Oh, really, my lord, I must Not object. altogether an unexpected occurrence, Mr. McDermott, when you appear for the defence. You are Bernard William Chadwick of 16 Murdoch Avenue, Ealing. Yes. A buyer in porcelain, fine china and fancy goods for the London firm of Brain and Harvard. Yes, I am. Do you travel for your firm, Mr. Chadwick? Extensively. In this country and abroad. In March of this year, did you pay a visit to Labra? Yes. Whilst in Labra, did you meet Betty Kane? Yes. Do you see her in court? Yes. That's the girl. Will you please tell the court how you met her? She picked me up. No! Silence in court. Continue, Mr. Chadwick. I didn't even notice her to begin with. I was busy with papers, reports and so on. Busy. Look at you drink. She asked me what I was doing. She seemed like a cute kid, so I bought her a drink and we talked for a bit. She said she was going to the flicks. To the pictures. And why didn't I come too? I'd finished for the day, so I went with her. Did you see her again? Every day after that. She used to come with me in the car. Just for the ride. What did you talk about? She told me she wasn't happy at home said it bored her so much she could scream. She had a string of complaints about her mother, but I didn't take much notice. She looked a pretty sleek little outfit to me. Oh, what? A well-cared-for young lady, my lord. How long did this idyll in Larborough last? About a week. Then it turned out her holiday ended the same day I was due to fly to Copenhagen on business. She asked me to take her with me. Now, to start with, I didn't go for the idea. I thought she'd be inexperienced. She was only just 18. She told you she was 18? She had her 18th birthday in Labra. Cost me a gold lipstick. You had no idea that at this time she was actually still only 50? Oh, not then, no. What made you change your mind and take her with you to Copenhagen? She convinced me that she wasn't. Wasn't what? Inexperienced. <laughs> so, you took her abroad with you as your wife? Yes. Do you remember the date you left Labra? I picked her up from the coach stop in Cheryl Road on the evening of March 28th. Where did you stay in Copenhagen, Mr. Chadwick? At the Red Shoes Hotel for two weeks. And then? We came back to England on April the 15th. It was only then she told me she decided not to go home. I was angry to begin with because it put me in a bit of a spot. I had the wife to think of. Anyway, after a lot of talk, I decided the best thing to do would be to take her down to the chalet I've got on the river, near Bournette. Frankie and I use it for weekends in the summer. I stayed the night there with her and went home to Ealing the next day. And afterwards? And for a week after that, I spent most nights at the chalet. But wasn't your wife surprised that you didn't sleep at home? Well, not really, no. Oh, she's got used to my uh, comings and goings. <clears throat> and how did the situation end? I went down to the chalet one night, found she'd gone. Later on you found why she'd gone and how? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chadwick. <laughs> this is a very belated story, isn't it? This case has been a matter for press report and public comment for weeks. If your story were true, you must have known that two women were being wrongfully accused. Why didn't you go straight to the police and tell them so? Because I didn't know anything about it. I knew nothing about this case until a couple of days ago. I've been abroad for my firm. Can you explain the condition in which the girl arrived home? No. It was not you who beat her? <laughs> no. You say you went down to the chalet one night and found she'd gone. Had all her belongings? and the luggage that contained them disappeared with her? Yes. And yet, 
She arrived home wearing only a dress and a pair of shoes. And with no luggage at all. I know nothing about that. No more questions, my lord? <laughs> Mrs Chadwick, when did you first begin to suspect that your husband had developed an interest elsewhere? The week after he got back from Copenhagen. A friend told me he had a guest staying at our chalet in Bourne End. Did you speak to him about it? No. It's not the first time it's happened. He attracts them like flies. And what did you do? What I always do with flies. I swapped them. I went down to the chalet one evening, hoping I'd catch them at it. At it? In bed together. Go on, please, Mrs. Chadwick. The door was unlocked, so I walked straight in. Okay, job I found quick, her it. lying on the bed. In the sort of negligee you used to see in vamp films ten years ago. The whole setup was stupid. She looked a real mess. Too much makeup, and she must have put her scent on with a ladle. Please confine yourself to essentials. Yes, sorry. And what happened next, Mrs. Chadwick? Well, we had the usual exchange, the what are you doing here stuff. The wronged wife and the mistress, that sort of thing. I never cared much on other occasions, but there was something about this one that really turned my stomach. Anyway, there came a point when the little tramp riled me so much that I pulled her off the bed and gave her a smack on the side of the head. You struck her? And how? I mean, yes. I hit her hard two or three times, and she started fighting back, and that got me in a flaming temper. Then we had quite a ding-dong, because she tripped up and banged her head on something. I thought she'd passed out and wanted to get some water to chuck at her. When I got back, she'd gone. Her negligee was lying on the floor, so I assumed she'd had time to dress. But her things were still lying around. I flung them in her suitcase and chucked it in the river. Did you tell your husband what you'd done? Eventually, yes. And what was his reaction? He said it was a pity her mother hadn't done the same thing years ago. And then you dismissed the entire affair from your mind? Yes. Well, did it come to mind later when you saw Betty Kane's picture in the newspapers? I saw all the things in the papers, of course, but I just never connected a 15-year-old schoolgirl who was kidnapped and beaten somewhere in the Midlands with that little tut I'd found lying in my bed. Anyway, I never knew her name. Bernard just called her Liz. If you had recognised the picture, would you have hesitated about going to the police owing to the fact that it was you who administered the beating? No. And I wouldn't hesitate to give her another beating tomorrow if I got the chance. I'll save my learned friend a question and ask you if you intend to divorce your husband. Certainly not. He's fun and he's a good provider. What more do you want in a husband? <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Chapman. Mr. Addison, do you wish to cross-examine? No, my lord. Do you have any more witnesses, Miss McClellan? The son of the owner of the hotel in Copenhagen, my lord. Uh, my lord? Uh, subject to your lordship's correction, we don't think it necessary to hear this witness. You have heard enough to arrive at a true verdict, and I cannot myself see that any further evidence would greatly clarify the subject. So be it. Do you uh, wish to hear any more from counsel? I know, my lord, thank you. We've reached our verdict already. And do you wish to retire? No, my lord. We are unanimous. <laughs> They let us out the back way when the crowd thinned out. Neville's dealing with the press boys now. Well, I should very much like to speak to Kevin McDermott before he returns to London. I've asked him to meet us at the hotel. At the moment, he's far too busy out there absorbing flattery like a sponge. So, life begins again. Tomorrow it'll just be the usual mixture of good and bad. How dull. Tomorrow you'll be vindicated in every newspaper in Britain, I can promise you that. And the appalling Betty Kane. I think we can safely leave Betty Kane to the police and her perjuring little friend, Rose Glynn. Must be somebody in this building who could boil a kettle. Would you like a cup of tea while we wait? Well, I should prefer a very large, dry martini. <sighs> My aunt's arranged a little celebration at home tonight. She makes a lethal martini. Oh, well, not tonight, Robert. Would you mind terribly? We're utterly exhausted. I'm not in the least exhausted. On the contrary, I feel exhilarated. I'm sorry, Mother, but you really must rest. Nonsense. Do please thank your aunt. She'll understand. Tomorrow, perhaps? Come on. Coast's clear. <coughs> Marion. I've imagined myself saying this in any number of places, but never in a courtroom corridor. 
Please don't. You know how I feel about you. I'd make your life a misery. Don't you care for me at all? I care for you a great deal. Then be my wife. My dear Robert, you know as well as I do that if a man isn't married by the time he's 40, then marriage isn't one of the things he wants out of life. It's just something that might have overtaken him like flu or income tax demand. I don't want to be something that's just overtaken you, Robert. I certainly wouldn't be an asset to Blair, Haywood and Bennett. I'm not asking you to marry Blair, Haywood and Bennett. I enjoy living with my mother. I love her. I actually like her. What about your aunt? Can't just park them like pieces of chewing gum. Look, was there much point to all this cloak and dagger stuff? Or are you two just playing hide and seek with the press gang? I mean, if we wait out there much longer, we're going to take root. I'm sorry, Stan. Your ma's really excited. Better than VE night, she says. <laughs> Didn't look so downcast. We won, didn't we? Ready? gone. You must go after her. She's left me no address. I'll never find her in London. It says they're leaving Norton this morning. Robert, there's only one train from Norton to London on a Thursday morning. Yes, I know. 8.40. It's now 8.42. But it stops at Milford, doesn't it? Aunt Liz, you're an angel. Mm -hmm. 